All right, I will kick it off. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Careers in Media and How to Get Them webinar. It is presented by the New York State Mentoring Program and Digiday Media. My name is Andrea Sanz, and I'm Chief People Officer at Digiday. And we have been working with the New York State Mentoring Program for almost a year now. So we are very excited to finally have this day be here and to start the webinar. And we developed this program to give you exposure to different types of roles within media organizations, but also more importantly almost to share stories and tips on how to break into the workforce. Digiday's CEO Nick Fries is here and will kick us off in a moment to give you a quick introduction to media and Digiday. But I'd like to first introduce you now quickly to Hope Reichard, who is our Director of Content, Events, and Digital Products, who will go through some housekeeping notes. Thank hey you. everyone, of course, thank you, Andrea. So right now, of course, Andrea said that we cannot see you. You are all attendees and participants for us. So throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, please throw those into the Q&A feature at the bottom of Zoom. Um, <clears throat> myself and Jill and some of our folks on the back end here will be going through these and adding them into our conversation. So we'll make sure your questions are answered. And if any of you would actually like to speak with us directly, you can use the raise hand feature. Um, and what will happen is I will go ahead and allow you to unmute yourself and you can talk to us directly, but I'm sure everyone's gonna go the Q&A route either way. Um, and if you have any questions about anything um, regarding this webinar tech wise, please just throw anything into the chat or the Q&A feature. And I think with that, I can throw that on over to our CEO, Nick Fries. Hi everybody, how are you? Happy Monday, hope you're doing well. Uh, great to be here with you today. Um, my name is Nick Fries. I'm the founder and CEO of Digiday Media. Uh, we've been around for about 14 years, um, but I've had a much longer career in media uh, previous to starting uh, Digiday Media. Uh, I grew up in a media family. Uh, my dad uh, worked for Newsweek for years. Um, probably some of you uh, probably have never even seen the print magazine of Newsweek. It used to be one of the biggest publications uh, in the country, most influential publications in the country, and now it's uh, you know just a shell of itself. But you know it just shows you how quickly media can change in today's media landscape. So I grew up around media. Um, my uncle was in media. My grandfather was in media. My other uncle was in media. Um, but it didn't guarantee that I was going to be able to break into media, but I ultimately did. And I can tell you a little bit about that too. But um, essentially the way that, you know, I, I didn't think that I was going to go into media when I was your age. You know, I really didn't have any idea what I wanted to do. I know I always wanted to start my own business, but I didn't know where it was going to be. Um, and that didn't come till later in my life. But um, media sort of found me. And um, you know, growing up around it, you know, I learned a lot just by being around my my family members. But the way that I would define media, you know, not the dictionary definition of media, but as a media owner, um, media really comes down to three areas, right? So it's you're a content creator, you've got a team of content creators, or you're a solo content creator, or you're uh, a multi tier organization that has multi brands that's creating content for publishing. Uh, so number one, you're a content creator. So whether that's text, audio, video, TV, film, um, et cetera. So that is the content creation piece of it. The second part of it is that you're creating this content for an audience, right? You want to develop a community. You want to build an audience. You want to grow an audience. You want to engage that audience by creating high quality content or content that you know, affects their lives in one way or another. It either informs them or entertains them or motivates them. Um, so those are two main things is creating the content and then creating the content for an engaged audience and growing that audience. The third piece of media is the business side of media because that's the only way you keep those two things going and growing, right? You can't create the content. You can't build an audience without business models that surround, that wrap that content and wrap that audience. So. Um, the way that we work as a business is we've got a diversified business model, and I can talk a little bit more about that, but the types of monetization strategies that media companies use, you, you're all aware of them, it's advertising, right? That's first and foremost, or subscriptions, or marketing services, or licensing, um, direct sales, commerce, um, events, and more. So. You can take a look at you know so many different forms of media, whether it's cable TV, you know, you've got 
fees. You're paying subscription fees. You're also, you've got advertising. You've got commerce that exists with that. With radio, mainly it's just, uh, it's advertising. With, with magazines, it's subscriptions and advertising and content services um, and more. Uh, so <clears throat> you really have to figure out ways that you can monetize your publications to be able to grow your publications. Because what you wanna do as a media company is you wanna have the best people because media is all about talent. And I didn't realize that until a little bit later in my career, how important that is. And I think that really is a linchpin to all great media companies. It's not only the people that are, that are running the business, but the people that are inside the company that are passionate about media, that are curious, that are driven, that are hungry, that are humble, and they're smart. Because great teams create great products. So whether you look at a company like, like Disney, clearly they have great teams and great people creating content. Um, <clears throat> I think if you look you know, all the way to a company like ours with Digiday, We've got incredible people across the, the spectrum of our teams who are passionate or who are committed um, because we're not making you know, nuts and bolts. We're not making widgets. Um, we're not writing code. What we're doing is we're, we've got creative services. We've got journalism at the heart of what we do. And it takes the best people to make these go and grow and to influence audiences. And the other thing with media is that you really have to have a point of view. So depending on what your publication is, um, you have to figure out what your mission is. And so for us at Digiday Media, it's all about informing and influencing different business industries. So we are in multiple industries for Digiday Media. We cover the fashion industry, the beauty industry, the retail industry, the media industry, the marketing industry, the advertising industry. We cover the HR industry and we're a global media business. But you know when we were building our company, at the foundation, we had to figure out, you know, what was our voice going to be? What was our point of view going to be? And we decided that we also wanted to create high quality content. And then that was first and foremost for us. So that all helped us grow our business. So, you know, just sort of circling back to the very beginning, I look at media as sort of three components with a glue that goes in between them. So it's creating content, it's building audiences and community, engaged communities, mm -hmm. it's building business models but you have to have talent that runs through all of that to make it really go and grow. Um, so with that, um, if there are any questions or you, if you'd like me to talk a little bit more about something, I'm happy to do that, um, but I can throw it back over to Andrea. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, and that is what good segue into the next portion because you talked about talent and we've got some of the great talented people here at Digiday that make it such a great place um, to work. So I will just kick it back right now to Jill Manoff. She is the editor-in-chief of our Glossy publication. She <laughs> is the moderator for this panel and she will introduce you to the panelists. So thank you, Jill, and thank you, Nick. Yeah, thank you both. So happy to be here and to chat with you all today. A large part of what we do at Digiday Media is we bring together leaders in what they do to, for valuable conversations. So you'll meet our esteemed panelists. Hope you, hopefully you all learn, learn a lot. Um, and we're going to jump on in. We're going to start with kind of a round robin type of a, a Q&A. We're going to ask everybody on the panel who they are, wh what they do at Digiday, what their job is, uh, we'll start there, and what skills are needed to do it well. Um, so I'm going to start, let's start with Denny. Hey, Denny. What's Hi, your job? Jill. Hi. Yeah, what's your position? Well, thank you. I'm the managing editor for Digiday in Espanol, and as Nick was saying, it's all about culture and, and being smart and, and being creative. So over here, is that what we need? Regardless if it's in Spanish or English, you have to definitely be creative and be humble and be hungry for success. So that's kind of like the three components of my job on, on, on the Espanol side, because it's a new product and it's diverse and, and the culture is tremendous. So, so that's that. And that's what I do, I think you like. Great on. Ivy, we'll toss it to you. What's your position? What skills are needed? <laughs> um, I'm Ivy, the Chief Creative um, Officer in Digital Media. Um, I lead and work with a unique and talented group of designers, you know, oversee strategy and execution of, you know, all creative activities at Digital Media. Um, my work includes, 
you know, brand development, editorial illustrations, videos, animations, you know, event design, product design, user experience, and basically anything creative. Um, one of the primary skills is, you know, passion, you know, being passionate about what I do, you know, forever looking for those creative possibilities, um, brainstorming ideas and crafting, you know, mental work with um, our team members here at Digiday. Um, while it's great to be passionate about, you know, my work, I, you know, must be also be skilled and knowledgeable in many other areas, such as, you know, keeping up to date on the latest in creative publishing, uh, web technologies, you know, fostering creative uh, creativity across, you know, the entire organization. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot for sure. Yeah. We'll dig in um, throughout this hour. Christina, tell us about your job. Hi, everyone. I'm the director of awards here at Digiday. Um, for me, uh, I am uh, in charge of the operational, all of the operations of our awards business. So basically what that is, is we recognize companies and brands from the industries that we cover in our editorial of Digiday. So um, yeah, all of that uh, if you've ever received an award, um, whether in school or outside of school, there's a whole process that comes before that. There's determining what the award is, who um, who's on the judging panel to decide who that awardee is, and then also creating the opportunity for people to receive their trophies or receive their recognition. So my team handles that whole process and um, what it takes really is first of all, to be a people person, um, because when it comes to the opportunity to be recognized, a lot of times people need to um, be, um, you need to talk them through the process of, uh, of why they should enter and um, kind of like what they're proud of. So you have to be also very supportive of people um, and kind of like that advocate throughout the industry to really um, make people feel like what the work that they're doing is important. And the final part of that is really to be curious. Um, with the awards business, there's a lot of things that you can honor and then you can cover. Um, and the only way that you can find out is by asking questions. So uh, my team builds all of those opportunities for people in marketing and media to be recognized. Um, and yeah, I, I, I love what I do. Yeah, such an important role at Digiday. We've got a great variety of talent. Up next, we've got James O'Brien. Good morning, Joe, and good morning to all of you. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is James O'Brien. I'm the president of a department within Digiday Media called Custom, and Custom is a sponsored content agency. And what does that mean? Uh, everybody wants to be in the paper. You know, everybody wants to be on the page. Everybody wants to be part of their of the most important uh, reporting and and analysis that's out there on the on the internet. But not everybody can be all at once, and some want to be right now. So what they do is they come to our agency and they say, "Look, we want to have an article on Digiday, or we want to have an article on Glossy. We want to have a video on Modern Retail. Or we want to be part of this podcast. And we have something to say, and we want it to sound and feel like the news that you're." reporting, but we want it now and we want it with a little bit more control than uh, just showing up for an interview. We have a team of really talented writers, uh, audio producers, video editors. Uh, we get together, talk with these particular companies that want to be with us telling their story, and we write something for them, or we make a short film for them, or we make a podcast episode for them. And then uh, we tell people, hey, this is sponsored, but the goal and what we achieve is that it's as meaningful as solid reporting can be. And so that's what custom the agency here at Digiday does. And I happen to try to run it as well as we can run it. And we have a really good time doing this. You do a great job. And last but not least, Nick Freeze. We heard about Digiday Media. We heard about media. What does a CEO do? <laughs> Gosh, and just watches the talent at the company do its thing, basically. No, no. Uh, I mean, a, a lot of things, a lot of worrying, a lot of staying up late at night or getting up early in the morning, but uh, but mainly just um, really thinking about, you know, constantly thinking about um, 
the evolution of our organization. You always have to be thinking two, three steps ahead. So I'm always thinking into the future. You know, not only you know our incredible leadership team um, manages the business so well now, but it's also you know seeing what's working and then starting to plot out you know where the product set goes, how the brands grow, and that's really what I'm thinking about. Probably 90% of the time is how do we continue to grow? How do we continue to evolve as an organization? How do we continue to improve our culture? Because culture is at the center. Um, <clears throat> you can have a group of talented people, but if those people aren't connected, aren't communicating well, they don't like each other, respect each other, you really can't do anything with that. Um, you've got to have teams that are that work well together, that respect each other, that treat each other well, that you know is start with kindness, respect, um, empathy. I mean, that's all central to creating great teams. I know it sounds fluffy and fuzzy, but uh, I can't emphasize enough how important that is when you get into the workplace because you do spend so much of your life working with your team members and inside your organization. You want to make sure you're at a place that supports you, um, <clears throat> that is empathetic to your needs, uh, understands who you are, wants to help you grow, uh, wants to help the teams grow. So <clears throat> really, when I you know look at my job, it really boils down to a few things. Really, it's the people inside the organization, the talent, um, making sure we're creating the best culture and programs for our people and growth for our people, and then also thinking about our products and our brands and how we grow those. So it's a never ending process and you never arrive. You're always on the path. Like we never get to a place where we say, oh, wow, okay, you know, we've, we've done it. We've got the best team or we've got, you know, the right brand. It, it, it just constantly evolves. It's sort of a state of, Net constant, never-ending improvement for us. For sure. Well, I like Nick at the beginning. You said media found me. That it's a good um, lead into our next question. Which let's combine the next two. I want to know from everybody: um, Did you even know that the job that you're in, when you first entered the workforce, your first full-time job, did you know that this job existed? And what advice would you give someone who's looking? to do the same thing or who who may, um, who yes, loves what you do and wants to do that as well. Danny, what would you say? So I always say that, well, as a managing editor of Espanol uh, in the US, especially in the US, the Hispanic growth, the population is tremendous. So by the time I started, we were 32 million. Now we're 62 million in the US. So the advance of like having the Spanish plus in your resume is always, obviously there. And I knew that eventually in DJ they exist because, you know, we, we created, but in other companies exist for like ever, like for years and decades. So I did knew that that was kind of like my strength. So I kind of like jump into it and kind of like make myself unique and have that as a, you know, as that capacity into my strength into like, okay, I'm fully bilingual. So I can put that into my resume and I can either help the company grow money wise or corporate culture wise. So both ways are win-wins for either, you know, the company and yourself again. So uh, I think that's key and that's relevant when, when you look into that. And yes, I'm, I always knew that like meaning, meaning like the, the managing editor of any publication whatsoever, especially in the United States is, is huge. And it's, it's a big role out there for sure. Yeah, we're going to dig into that. I love that you took some bold moves and we're going to hear all about those as well. Uh, Ivy, did you know your job existed? Uh, I had um, no idea I would land, you know, in the world of publishing and media. Um, it kind of happened just organically, you know, one thing led to another and here I am. <laughs> but one thing I knew was that um, I always wanted to use storytelling um, I wanted to build empathy and reach people emotionally. Um, working in media um, allowed me to, you know, access to a broad and diverse audience that um, I may not have had access um, to otherwise. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, what advice would you give others? Um, same type of open-mindedness, I guess. Yeah, just like, you know, surround yourself um, with creativity, you know, um, be really passionate about, you know, what you do and, you know, just really follow that, um, that goal, you know, that, that mindset. So, <laughs> yeah, that's great. Christina, awards, I would think the answer is no. 
I will definitely say that I didn't know that producing award shows was a job before I got into my first opportunity producing award shows. Um, and now in hindsight, I realized that that wasn't, I, that wasn't something that I needed to know. Um, everything I needed to know about awards I learned on the job, but what I needed to know, what I did know before I started working my first full-time job in awards was the size company that I wanted to work for. All of my internships taught me that. Um, my internships I did in really large companies where you can't even count how many people work with you and then also super small companies of one to two people. Through that process, I learned what type of company I wanna work for. And so throughout my career, I've only worked for companies where I am able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with the CEO where um, I have a small team and there's not much red tape really that needs that that is above you. So you can kind of feel free to experiment and share your ideas and they'll actually be listened to. So those kinds of things, as well as my career interests, which were putting on events, um, celebrating other people and doing marketing uh, is really the skill set that helped bring all of these things together. So I'll definitely say when it comes to your first full-time job, know, like Ivy said, what you like to do and then who you like to work with and then everything else can be learned afterwards. Yes, I think James would say the same thing. Before we jump to James, let's, let's all do a show of hands and um, at, answer this question that just came in from the audience. How many of you are working a job that is related to your major? Raise your hand. Oh, not me. Am I the only one? <laughs> I'm in Andrea as well. Hey, all right. We'll talk more about that. James, did you know your job existed? I don't think it existed. Um, I, I, I knew that the job of working with stories and words and storytelling existed. And, and I, I had no, there was never a time in my life, even as a, a four or five-year-old kid when I wasn't writing stories in the back seat of the car, that kind of thing. But um, I knew, so I, yeah, I, in, in a sense, the answer is yes. I knew that I would be working with words and stories all the way along. The particular kind of content that we make in the way that we make it, uh, and we'll talk about this later, actually happened to sort of evolve in front of me around 2009, 2010, 2011. And I kept saying I would never do it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I feel like you, there's a lot of confidence on this team in terms of like those that knew what they wanted to do and kind of said, you know, I'll figure it out. I think that, um, you know, for me, they're like mentorship and more guidance beyond, I guess, my inner circle and maybe my family who maybe not be the most worldly <laughs> in terms of directing me that way is, is something to also keep in mind um, and, and find the right connections and network networking opportunities. Nick, you talked about you, um, your experience in media, what you knew maybe from your family. I would love for you to focus on um, the skills, what advice you would give um, others looking to do, become a CEO someday. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I do want to just like throw out a caveat here is that, yeah, my family was in media, but it didn't guarantee me a spot in media, nor did it guarantee that I would get into it. Uh, Again, it found me uh, when I was living in Colorado, and um, I was a ski instructor out there right after co after um, college. And um, the season ended, and there were no jobs. Um, so I applied for this job to sell advertising, so to be on the business side for ski magazine and skiing. And <laughs> you know, I have no idea how I got the job, but I got the job. And so I would travel around, and I would sell special advertising sections for ski and skiing. And I loved it because I was dealing with people. I mean, it really, the ad part was, you know, whatever. For me, it was really about building the relationships with all these people who ran these resorts and traveling to these awesome places and building relationships. And, and, um, and it was a really good job. And so then after that, I said to myself, okay, I really like media. This is cool. I want to move back to New York and I want to get into the, to the workplace in New York. Well, the way it was back then, you could not get into media in New York if you didn't work in media in New York. It was so incestuous. It was, you just couldn't break in. So I got rejected by every publication I went to. 
They said, did you have New York experience? I'd say, no, they go, oh, we can't hire you. I went on an interview one time where a guy said, you would hurt our business if you worked for us because you don't know anything. <laughs> so, but I didn't give up. I was absolutely relentless. I didn't stop going on interviews. After I'd interview, I would constantly write follow-up notes. I would send them things. I was just like the biggest pest you could ever imagine. And, um, and I finally got a break. And then I got another break. Somebody said, oh my God, this guy is so annoying. I just, we got to bring him on so he'll just stop. So, um, so that's really where it started for me. And, you know, like Christina said, I, was, I got to work in some big companies and I realized that the big companies really weren't for me because I didn't want to just move things by percentage points. I wanted to like, you know, blow things open. I wanted to create, you know, new products. I didn't want to just have to like take share from 1% to 2%. You know, I wanted to take it from zero to hundred and do new things. And so um, I started to work for like some startups and it just blew my mind, like the experience. And so that's how I broke in. And I broke in just because I was absolutely relentless in my approach. And just because my family had been in it, it gave me an advantage of like just sort of understanding the business, but by no means did it like give me a walk-in. So um, that's what I would recommend to anybody who wants to get in the business. Number one, never give up. Find a place where you can learn great leaders. I got that opportunity to get some really great publishing leaders, people who were legends in media, you know, um, who are now retired, but um, that really helped me. And so I worked for big companies. I learned so much from those big companies. It was like going to graduate school or getting my master's, working at Hearst, working at Meredith, working at the New York Times company, I mean, that is really what helped me. Um, then to take all that learning, what I liked, what I didn't, and then apply it to even what we're doing today and our approach at Digiday Media. So um, even if someone says, you know, rejects you, doesn't, you know, doesn't um, respond to your inquiry, just keep going, never give up. Yeah, I like that. You knew it was, it existed, but you're like, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to do it better in a new way. <laughs> I'm going to innovate in that space. Very cool. Well, we're going to dig into, I guess, everyone's career path a little bit more. Different people on the panel owe their, their road or what catapulted them to their next step um, to different things. But Christina, I know, for instance, for you, um, the T. Howard Foundation was very instrumental in in your next step. Tell us about that and, and what happened there. Sure. Um, so I had my very first internship experience just about 10 years ago. Uh, this was with um, BBC in, in New York. And um, actually, just like Nick was saying uh, just now, uh, I first was told that I didn't have enough experience and that I should try again next year. And um, what I did was applied anyway. And I told them I intend to get this job this summer and uh, I ended up getting it. So um, I, what he said really resonated with me, the never giving up. And actually when people tell you no, push harder for the yes. Um, that kind of created a little bit of career padding for me to apply to fellowships would, would um, further supercharge my career in marketing and media and helped me learn more. Um, the T. Howard Foundation, they're uh, basically a fellowship designed for um, students, underrepresented students in their first couple of years of college. And um, they, what they do is it's a bit of a training program. So there's a mentorship aspect to it. There's workshops for um, preparing you for your career as well as a service where they uh, put you in touch with large media companies in New York and around the United States. And um, you start interviewing with those companies. And then if you can land the role, you become a T. Howard Fellow. So I went through the entire process with them. Um, I started in uh, the September or October of my junior year or my senior, yeah, my junior year of college. Um, and it was a pretty lengthy process, but in the end, I landed my second internship uh, with the help of T. Howard Foundation. Um, through that opportunity, um, not only did I have a really enriching internship experience um, that following summer, but I also met 50 to 60 interns in New York 
and their um, and their supervisors, as well as my, our own mentors, and really just got to practice my networking skills. I learned invaluable um, advice, such as uh, that that takes you from the interview process all the way to the end of your internship, to really help you stick out. And um, what I love the most about the T. Howard Foundation is the fact that you can give back. So I'm actively a mentor for that organization, and um, I still think that this there's a lot of work to be done in terms of increasing diversity in the media industry. And uh, that's one of my own personal passions. And I just love that this foundation exists and that there's other foundations like it to have people who look like me and ha had the same opportunities as me to really um, break in to the industry. For sure. Well, you mentioned that you got some guidance in terms of how to stand out in your internship. Uh, what would you say were, how did you go about that and, and how important was that? Yeah, I think um, every extra step that I took during my internships um, really helped pull me closer to my, where I am now. And it sounds a little bit corny, but um, there are a lot of things that I did in those summers that really made me um, stand out as a leader, um, even though, you know, I was still an intern and I was still learning things. Um, what I learned during my internships and the advice that I got was never be above anything, any task, anything that your team has to do and always raise your hand. Um, so I volunteered to do a lot of things and I'm not just talking about, you know, buying the bagels and setting them up in the morning for the company, <laughs> but I'm talking about the more undesirable things, cold calling clients, cold calling vendors, um, taking notes at meetings, uh, shadowing people during their site visits, all of these things that you don't necessarily have to do, but um, by doing them, you get access to people who are higher up in the company, people who you might want to be one day. And um, all of these opportunities for me volunteering and raising my hand during my internships put me in front of people who are influential and who um, I could learn a lot from. So that's definitely my biggest piece of advice is whenever you have the opportunity to do something that you don't necessarily know how to do, always do it because you're going to take something out of it, whether it's that you love it and you want to do more of it or that you hate it and you don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> it's so old school to say like, pay your dues, but we all can, I'm sure, recall a time where we were doing almost grunt work or things that that we that maybe an outsider would see it as though but that really proved valuable to the company and making the company run right mm -hmm. exactly yeah people notice that's that's for sure for sure well nick back to you um <laughs> i i see you as this expert networker uh you know when i'm trying to book a meeting on your calendar you're like i'm meeting with this person i'm like wow he's out there <laughs> tell me about the value of networking that the value that's played into your your career path and um, your success. Sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And it's really important. I mean, in, in all walks of life, uh, networking is uh, a really powerful uh, uh, springboard for you as you go through your career. And so you always need to be building your network. And um, my network that I had before uh, building Digital Media um, was the one that actually gave me the start. To, to launch my own business. So, um, you know, Digiday Media was just an idea I had. And when I launched the company, I launched it out of a Starbucks on my laptop, basically. And I didn't have any money. Um, you know, I just had some ideas and I had friends. I had friends that were in an industry that, um, that trusted me, that uh, when I went to them to tell them about the idea to get them involved in Digiday Media, and they said, okay, you know, I'll take a, I'll take a bet on you. And so, um, you know, still that network today helps us, you know, helps us grow, you know, whether it's trying to find somebody to hire for a certain position or to launch a new product or to come speak at one of our events um, or to give us advice about taking the next steps. It's always tapping into your network. And so, um, you know, what's interesting is my network actually, it grew <clears throat> along the way. So people that, you know, we were sort of the same, we had the same jobs, just working in different companies, you know, these people just kept rising up. And so I grew with them, some of them, you know, went on and did, you know, much bigger and better things. But 
your network is a really powerful tool as you get into your career. So, um, you know, in, in terms of mentors are part of your network, obviously. And so anybody here that's really passionate about media, I'm always available to talk. Um, we can do a Zoom, we can do a call, we can just exchange emails. Uh, any way I can help you out if you're interested in getting into the media business on any side, or it's the editorial side or the creative side or the marketing side or, um, <clears throat> or the business side, you know, I'm, I'm here to help. And uh, I wouldn't, you know, digital media wouldn't be where it is today without um, people who were friends and mentors and part of the network. Yeah. Well, on the same note, in terms of building out your network, you built out <laughs> the company from your very first hire to the next hire to the next hire after that. Um, what, do you, what is it that you look for? You know that somebody's going to be successful in-house um, when interviewing, talking to someone. What, what are those skills? Yeah, I mean, it's changed so much over the years, Jill. <laughs> As you know, you've been with us for, for, um, <clears throat> for a good period, and um, you've seen the evolution of the organization. And um, really, it boils down for Digiday Media. It, people really have to embody these sort of three things. It's really the humble, the hungry, and the smart. When you're humble, you're willing to be a team player. You know, you, you don't always have to take credit for everything or, you know, jump leapfrog over anybody or, you know, you become a part of the group and that humility sort of creates a culture and, 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 a, and a vibe uh, inside an organization when you're like that. I mean, it's like, you know it when you see it, right? Versus, you know, and, you know, an egomaniac when you see it. So <clears throat> humble is key for digital media. Um, the hungry piece is there's so many challenges, uh, you know, in, in building a business from scratch or even just running a business day to day. They're just challenges in life. And you have to be driven. You have to just keep going every time someone says no to you or, or every time something fails or doesn't work. You just have to get back up. And so that's the hungry piece of it. Uh, and also the hungry piece of it goes into career growth and personal growth. So the, the hungry is um, really key. And then the smart piece is not just, you know, your IQ. It's really your, your social IQ or your emotional IQ. That, that's really key because if you have the right sensibilities emotionally and socially, um, <clears throat> you can do a great job leading people, um, leading teams, working within teams, uh, getting people to connect with you outside of the organization, working with clients. So that's why we look for people who embody the humble, hungry, and smart. And um, and I'm sure as you can see here, all the participants that this group here um, that's been presented to you today embodies all of those things. For sure. Well, thank you, Nick. We're going to jump on over to Denny. Um, I have a totally different set of questions. You talked a little bit about Denny, the um, I guess English is your second language and entering the workforce in the States. Uh, we talked offline about the fact that how you really use that to your advantage and leverage that to, to getting your foot in the door. Talk a little bit about that. Well, yes. Well, basically uh, I'll say that I will always carry with me the empire state of mind kind of thing. Uh, I think a lot of the people on the, on the crew uh, relates, you know, the, the assistant. So, I graduated uh, from school and then I inter I actually entered uh, on CNN, my first internship in, in New York. Um, well, I actually crossed the ocean. I uh, finished my university, got my first internship, but, but like I knocked the doors like so many times. And for me, it was like just key to like put my feet on the ground in New York City it was kind of like a dream come through. Like I always kind of like, you know, have it on my on my wall kind of thing and back in Bogota, Colombia, because I'm from Colombia. So I was like, you know, a lot of people will tell me, yeah, you'll never make it or you will never speak English or whatever. So here I am, you know, and I was like, no, well, let's, you know, uh, dedicate this uh, perseverance and hard work and as much as I can do. So when I when I got into the CNN internship, they even sponsored the visa and everything. Uh, they have the CNN in Espanol thing. And I remember like I was like 19 years old and we were covering the United Nations. And I remember shadowing the correspondents, like interviewing, you know, uh, presidents and everything at that age. So I was like, this is definitely what I want to do. And and it was a, it's a, it was a great opportunity. And right after that, I was like, I'm not going to get back to South America. Let me just keep moving in New York City. And, you know, we have family uh, and, you know, they helped me a little bit. But then. I think knocking on the door of La Mega, which is a radio station that still 
an FM in New York City and, and a lot of other people probably listening to the Latino, salsa, merengue and all that stuff. So I was like, maybe there. I mean, if they can open the door for me, regardless, you know, even though you have like the CNN internship that doesn't guarantee you, you're going to just get straight to CNN. Uh, so I actually got the first job uh, on La Mega. Uh, I didn't even have a, a, an appointment. I just went on the door on 50, 50, 56th Street between 5th and 6th uh, Avenue. And, and I was like, uh, I told to the receptionist, I was like, so I'm, I'm looking for uh, Carrie Davis. Those days he was the general manager. Uh, and he's like, and she's like, well, he just left for lunch. I mean, he, unfortunately, I'm like, he just left, like he just passed by you. So I was like, oh my God. So I run into Fifth Avenue and I was like, Carrie, he didn't even know me. And I was like, this is my story. Uh, well, you know, I'm from Bogota. I want a, an opportunity in New York. And, you know, as much as I can do English or Spanish, I love La Mega. And since then, he's like, so you came all the way from Bogota and did this internship and you're here out of the blue. Okay, let's go to my office because this is just insane. So you just got to have some like the hungry thing that uh, Nick was talking about, you know, it's like just determined, like determination. And I, what I always say it is like, what makes you unique is what makes you stronger within the company, within the organization. So for me, it was like that drive of, of getting in there. So once I was there, I landed like, you know, long story short, a career of 15 years uh, working everything from NBC, ESPN, Yahoo, and always have the duality of like me, for instance, in the investigative unit at NBC, I was the one, uh, you know, talking with the people and you know being able to uh, translate because you know some of the victims could be Hispanic victims, you know, so they relate to a good human being and they can tell you the story and they can take take you the angles of the story. Or even when you interview criminals or presence or whatsoever, if you're a journalist, you're a good person. First of all, like that's, that's the first thing that you have to be when you you just choose to be a journalist. And when you're out there, you have to be hungry, no, not because of the exclusive that you're going to get, but because of the human aspect of the story that you're bringing to the table. So that's kind of like the deal. When you even cover breaking news, you, you, you bring that to. So that's that's kind of like long story short of that career. Mm -hmm. My bad. Um, you talked about walking right up to the, the head honcho there and you are very bold. Um, what would you say? I, I would say being resourceful, knowing who the contact was to approach. Um, what's the key to getting access to getting the support you need? Um, is it about knowing who to talk to? Absolutely. That's part of the, the thing that Nick was saying about networking. I kind of like uh, you choose like a mentor there and kind of like do your way up uh, networking with anyone whatsoever. It could be even the receptionist that there that day in that building. Because if, you, if it wasn't for her, she's my friend. These days, like we just go for coffee and just talk about it. But but she's still there and she still is my friend and she opens that door for me, you know, in, in Mega and SVS that day. So be friends with everybody. Be optimistic and be friendly, be analytic, be creative all the time. And, and I think those are the tools to, to take you up to, to the letter. And, and I think uh, the, the whole importance of like finding that unique moment. And if there is somebody there that is, is approaching and is, is you know getting into an idea that actually is gonna be successful or whatever, they'll give you the chance. You take it as your best advantage, right? And so that's yeah. kind of like the way, the way you go. And I think, uh, you know, for the most part, when I do interviews and everything, I, I, I believe the human aspect touches everybody. So for instance, I'll bring to the table one interview that I did with Kobe Bryant, rest in peace, when he was uh, in the, the last press conference that he did in the Staples Center in the Lakers in, in, in Los Angeles. They were taking his numbers down because obviously to honor his career. And the first question was given to ESPN, ESPN. So I was working for ESPN, but I knew he actually speaks in Spanish. So, so I was like, let me ask the question in Spanish because everybody's gonna sp speak in English and this guy has fans all over the world. So, you know, they gave me the microphone and I was like asking Kobe for an advice for others, you know, to fulfill those dreams. And he's like, yeah, determination, you know, and he answers in Spanish. And that question went bombarding to all the Spanish countries because that was his 
first question on his very last uh, press conference in the in the Lakers stadiums in in Staples yeah. Center. So you know all those little that. details that you that you take that opportunity and you create a unique moment. So you be your unique moment as well. Like create that strain and show it to the world. Be humble, but be determined and be hard worker. I would say, you know, come up earlier. Like when, when I was 19 years old, I didn't care. I have all the time in the world. So I remember even waking up at four, I start writing news at five and then being the last one going home. So I think those efforts pay well down the road and yes. networking for sure. Good advice. Such a good example of being hungry. You went for it. Uh, Jay, <laughs> let's bounce to James because you definitely have a different unique career path among the panelists in, in that you have a lot of freelance um, experience. But when talking ahead of this or prior to the this session, you told me about the importance of, I guess, getting your start in-house um, versus via freelance work. Tell me about why you said that. Network and resources. I can think of three ways to, to talk about that. Um, everybody that you work with, your first job out of college, let's say, everyone you work with there may well be the person that gets you into your best job three or five years down the road. Um, you don't know who's going to unlock the next best thing for you. And you will find them all in one place if you join a team at the start. And, and there's another reason to, to, to join a team at the start. And the second thing I'd talk about is um, learn and make mistakes with the support of people who've learned and made mistakes before you. And, and as you do that, you're gonna be uncomfortable, but you're gonna learn something about uh, who is going to support you and you'll also learn um, who should be in your network because they support you and that helps contribute to that first thing you add these people to your network because they've supported you while you've learned and made mistakes they've watched you learn and make mistakes and recover they get to know who you are they get to know your character and then one of them down the road is starting a new enterprise a new business or they just got hired as the leader at a new company and they need to hire staff to join them you're a part of their network too. So joining that organization at the beginning really unlocks those things. And I guess the third is the resources, right? Um, it's a shortcut, especially early in your career to um, technology and training that uh, maybe aren't in your budget when you're first coming out of college or you're just getting started. You might not be able to uh, buy all the software you need to make really great you know, videos or audio or, or um, a number of things. You might not be able to get your hands on the kind of computer that you need. Um, when you join an organization, part of the bargain is that you're working for them and you're contributing to them, but you're getting to learn all the stuff that normally you might not get to touch after college. So those three things really, to me, helped when I started working in journalism before I got into what I do now. I would never have known or had access to tools to learn how to lay out a newspaper page or uh, do any of the things that, that had to happen from the editor's desk. And so that's, that's why I think it's really important to give yourself that shot. When I was in high school, I don't know if that guy would have said the same thing. He was pretty much like, strike out on your own, do your own thing. And I did. And it was good for different reasons. But when I talk about the job that I'm doing now, uh, it's it's so technology dependent. There's so much, and then the world has you know become so technology dependent, and you need that network to cut through the noise. I'd say that I would tell that kid back in high school, senior in high school, I get you, but go work with some other writers. Yeah, nice advice. Well, James, you for those who don't know you, you are a multi talented guy. He cooks. He's been in a band. He's a musician. <laughs> How have you ensured that you've been? Um, happy at what you do. You've been able to follow your passions, but at the same time, you've been able to make a living. You hear about like in the artist community, like that, that's the balance is a struggle. Yeah. I'm going to answer this super short um, because I, I also saw this question come up that I'd love to, to answer for one of the, the attendees yeah. at the moment. But um, I'd say the short answer to, to you said, you know, how do you maintain balance? How do you maintain happiness? Um, Get interested in whatever you're going to do. Get interested in the business side of everything that is part of your job. Um, that's like 
Like if you, if you if you don't understand where the money's coming from that's keeping you in your position, or if you're working for yourself, keeping you in your apartment, it's like um, it's like driving a muscle car, like a beautiful you know uh, Dodge Charger down a highway and never looking at the gas gauge. And what you're going to end up with is a Dodge Charger on the side of the highway. So you have to. Uh, I really, and again, if I had said this to the 17 and 18 year old kid coming out of high school, he would think, what are you talking about? But learn the business side of everything that, that you do that you're passionate about. If you want to do it, know how it happens behind the scenes. And then even if your job is only tapping the keys or turning on the video camera, um, you understand why you fit into this organization, what you represent to them in terms of money coming in and money going out. And if you're doing it for yourself, do it because you have to do it to survive. Um, that's the short answer to, to maintaining happiness because unhappiness lies in not getting to do what you like to do because yeah. you weren't watching where things were going financially or you weren't watching where your industry was going and you weren't making moves when you knew that like, hey, this is like getting taken over by this kind of practice. I should go and learn that practice because that's where the business is going. Mm -hmm. That's what I ended up doing in life was, was um, understanding that skills that you have can be applied to a number of kinds of jobs. If you learn the industry and you learn the business by just talking to those people you work with, you can make better choices and stay in the work that you like to stay in. And then have all, you know, the ability to do all the other things you like to do too. For sure. I know you were going to tackle one of the questions that came in. We're going to hold those for the very end. Keep those questions coming. We've got a couple more. Um, and then we're going to bounce to Ivy um, to learn more about your job. I know you've got artists in the family. You are also multi-talented and creative. Um, tell me about how you're just like Nick, maybe what your parents did or family members did um, in the same, a similar field or adjacent field. Did you intentionally want to do something different? Um, did you, is it just that talent runs in the family? Tell me about your different path versus theirs. Um, well, born into a, a family of designers, um, landscape designers, performing artists, you know, musicians and sculptors, um, it was natural for me to adopt art and design. Um, my parents, you know, heavily influenced me from a young age. You know, back then there were no iPads or iPhones. You know, all I had was, you know, the canvas in front of me. So um, my father is um, a well-known uh, Chinese sculptor and my mom's a landscape designer. You know, they're both award-winning designers and professors. Um, they had, you know, a clear goal, which is um, to bring me to America so we can have, you know, more and better opportunities. So they basically dropped everything um, that made them su successful and, you know, came to New York City. Um, things were tough when we got here. Uh, my parents, you know, stayed up nights, you know, finishing projects from a textile company they used to work for. I remember helping my mom finish a project from like 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. just so she could get some shut eye at like the age of nine, which is, you know, insane. I, I have a daughter. I can never imagine her like doing that for me. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of struggles as, you know, the first generation um, migrated to the States. Um, my parents knew that they never wanted me to, you know, go through what they went through, you know, cause they want, you know, better for me. Um, so when I graduated high school while other kids were, you know, busy going on vacations, they just pushed me so hard and, you know, just told me to stay home and just build my art portfolio, like constantly build your portfolio. And um, I remember going to like the Metropolitan Museum and just sitting in the corner and like sketching out people that's walking by me or copying, replicating a Picasso painting or something and people were like oh my god this little girl like she's amazing you know and that like fueled me you know um so yeah so they pushed me really hard and you know just told me to stay home like work on the portfolio and you know all the hard work you know really paid off because you know, I got accepted to multiple art universities you know and but choosing a major was like the most difficult decision I ever had to make because, you know, design is just so broad. Like, should I go into industrial design, uh, go into animation? Should I go into furniture or fashion design? Um, but one of the most helpful advices, piece of advice that my mother gave me was um, to go into something that that will have a chance to kind of 
bloom into something else, you know, something broader, not limited. Um, you know, just because my parents picked up sculpting and landscape design doesn't mean, you know, I have to follow in the same footsteps. Also, sure. the opportunities here are, are very different from, you know, China. So culture and economies, you know, they're all different. So then that's when I realized I wanted to go into graphic design. You know, I excelled in like every class in college, then graduated with honors. I then returned uh, to New York City to get my master's at Parsons with a design, um, with a degree in design and technology. And that's when the world's like really opened up for me. I was exposed to interactive design, exhibition design, programming, product design, you know, animation, fashion and technology, and just so much more. And there's just so much to absorb in this field. And, um, you know, the field is constantly evolving. And even to this day, you know, I never stop learning, you know, in the design worlds. And um, I also work with my parents and their company on projects ranging broadly in scale. Um, so design is versatile. You know, it was a dream come true for them to start their own design firm after leaving the States, returning to China. So, yeah, I just... I didn't have to follow exactly what they did. Right. Um, and a personal dream of mine um, that will be similar to their theirs is um, I would love to teach at university level later. <laughs> oh, that would be amazing. Oh my gosh. Well, let's tackle quickly the, the questions that came in and hopefully we have time, further time after that to dig in um, to Ivy's path because you definitely have this I guess left and right side of the brain, you're definitely um, managing a team while while remaining creative and leading the art or the art on digital media. But really quick, I think that um, a question came in regarding hiring someone right right out of college. Anybody want to tackle that, James? Is that the question that you were looking to answer? It is. Um, could one about here we go. I'm starting my video back up. Um, I think about this a lot because. I work with people that create things, you know, words, pictures, sounds. And when you're in college, assuming that you're studying for that, but even if you're not and you decide you want to do that, um, everything counts on you creating stuff, make stuff, use those college studios, those college labs. Um, even if you're in science um, and, and you're working in the lab, um, look at your notes as a way of proving who you are in the lab to the first person you're going to interview with when you don't have any job experience. Um, make that film that goes beyond what the class assignment was and tuck it away. I learned this in graduate school. Um, I learned that every paper I wrote could be something that fueled my dissertation at the end. Um, every film I made for a documentary class could be something that I used to get work outside of college in making film or podcasts afterward. So just create any chance you have in college to create and create with the idea that like, I'm doing this for class and a grade, but I'm talking, I'm trying to do this at a level that's like, I stand for something with this and I can tuck it away. And it's the beginning of your portfolio and it counts, especially that first job interview. Yes. Really good advice. Would anybody want to also not hi um, answer the question regarding hires? Young, like young folks. I'd like to add something because it's something I've been thinking about a lot in the past year, especially as students um, who were affected by um, the fact that COVID closed a lot of colleges for a couple of years are now graduating and coming out into the workforce. Something that I feel is missing in, um, in terms of the skill set of people who are entering the workforce now are actually soft skills. So the ability to effectively communicate what you want and need to the people on your team, the ability or the, um, yeah, the ability to delegate responsibilities and tasks, um, to read other people and um, fight for what you want and need in terms of um, your business objectives. Uh, a lot of students now are coming out with amazing set of technical skills and the ability to do the job. But do you have the skills that are necessary to get promotions and lead teams? This is something that's very important that was missed a lot from the, I, be, I believe it's from the, the in-person, the lack of in-person over the past couple of years. Um, but if there's something to focus on, definitely 
when um, you have the opportunity to work with a team, lead a team during your studies, um, interact with people in person and work on your communication skills. It's going to be something that's going to set you apart when you enter the workforce. That's great. Someone asked, I'll, I'll let Andrea answer the technical answer <laughs> or give the technical answer to the question about the, the working hours. Um, the, student, the students want to know, um, what are our working hours? Well, our official working hours were 9.30 to 5.30, but we are, um, one of the things that happened to us in the pandemic is we are a very dispersed workforce. So we've got people in California, people in the UK. So um, to be honest, we're pretty flexible. Nick has created a really great culture, um, you know, in terms of, you know, hope in California doesn't have to be on at 6.30 every day, her time, um, but those are our official hours, 9.30 to 5.30. Yeah, and um, just to add add to that, we uh, have a four and a half day work week. So um, we end every week at, uh, at one o'clock on Friday. Um, so, you know, just knowing that people are putting their all in sort of, <clears throat> you know, all week long, it's good to get a little extra for a weekend. So, so yes. I want to I want to add something to that question. And when you're 18, 19, don't even think about the work hours. Think about the job that you can do and achieve in as many hours as needed, because that's what takes you to succeed, success at the end of the row. I never thought a minute about the work hours or how many hours I put in my job. Like that's my best advice. You know, like don't don't. That, this is not the stage to think about or, or hours of work or if I enter late or so like you know enter earlier and go lay home. It's fine. You're 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 here for that. <laughs> Yeah. And if someone's lucky enough to know what they want to do and where they want to do it, they know the company, they're going for it. Uh, Denny, you touched on the persistence that it took to get your foot in the door. Someone had a great question about when are you being persistent versus annoying? Um, I mean, does it matter? Can you be annoying? What would you guys say? Yes, be, be annoying. It doesn't matter. Knock on the door as many times as you have to. I think there is always a way. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I can knock the door. Uh, you know, uh, and saying, hey, I'm relevant and this and that and not necessarily being annoying. I mean, it's just the fact that you create that opportunity, you know, so we, when you create that opportunity, and even if it's in the middle of the subway or in the street or whatever it is, well, be annoying because that's the only path that you, I mean, there's, as, a, as Nick was saying, it was so hard back in the days to get into business, media business in New York. Now you have social media, you can reach out like Twitter, even Instagram as much as you can, you know, like, so be annoying. <laughs> Go well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not on the panel, but I just want to add to that as someone who's the head of HR, um, you know, to gets people sending things. I think the thing about it is um, to, if you are going to keep persisting, like bring something to the party different each time, you know, don't just keep saying, you know, Hey, I want to talk to you. Hey, I want to talk to you. It could be, Hey, I found this article you might be interested in, or, Hey, I, um, met, I don't know, just something different. Um, so it's not so much about the quantity of persistence, but also try to vary up what you're saying. So it's not just the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, that's great. And somebody asked how you get experience. I want to say be annoying. Like you can definitely, like Nick said, like all of us, I, I think we're all game. <laughs> Reach out. Um, First name at digiday.com. <laughs> um, and Andrea can definitely um, share more about opportunities um, and wrap it up from here. I think this was great. Yeah. Thank you so much. We're a little bit over, but thank you to all the moderators. I'm sorry, the panelists, the moderators, everybody behind the scene. Thank you to Keith Howard for your help in putting this together. Hope you found it valuable and got some tips that will help you in your career. Just a couple follow-ups. Um, following this meeting, Keith is going to distribute a leave behind that we created that does have some more career advice as well as some interview tips. Um, and we are also very excited talking about experience to offer one of you an internship at Digiday this summer. Um, it will be paid. It's going to be part-time. Keith will also distribute all the information about that and how you can apply. And we hope that many of you do. Um, as Jill just said, my contact is Andrea at digiday.com. If you want to follow up with any questions, um, whether it be about the internship or the webinar, I'm happy to answer them. And so thank you so much for attending. Thanks to everybody again, and I hope everybody has a great day.